Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled in the studio today is author, curator, Judy Freeman. She's going to tell us all about Picasso. But before we talk to Judy, Dougie Fields, who is an artist from London, has done a new performance piece. He sent the piece over to us, and we were anxious to get it for you to see. So you'll see things like this. It's a... a uh, self-portrait of Dougie. He pays uh, special attention to artists that he really likes. You'll notice some of the art of certain people in, in this uh, performance piece. So look for these images and watch The Big Riddle by Dougie Fields. ideology. I rationalize, I theorize, I think I know reality. I fantasize, I memorize, dream the states of ecstasy. I objectify, I mystify, I wonder is this destiny. I organize, I realize, I feel. I don't understand why. I sanctify, I scream, cry. There is no causal inconsistency. Life is the big riddle. I bleed and I giggle. Change is the only constancy. Aha, ha, ha, aha, ha, ha. I'm enough, really enough, really enough. Smile and get on down, please. and revolutionize the strictures of democracy. I celebrate. I want to eradicate the causes of catastrophe. I philosophize. I want to minimize the traumas of humanity. I want to initiate, not deviate. Property is not propriety. I lie awake. I commiserate the prisoners of vanity. Lose your ego, not your mind. Happiness is what you find. Aha, ha, ha, aha, ha, ha, I'm alive. Really, really, smile and get on down, please. Oh me, oh my, get on a creative high. The present is eternity. Aha, ha, ha, aha, ha, ha, I'm alive. Aha, ha, ha, aha, ha, ha, I'm alive. I can speculate on the promise of transcendency. I want to glamorize. I want to terrorize. I want to escape away the victims of bureaucracy. I trivialize. I can criticize. I am driven by my own inadequacy. I get exercised. I get emotionalized. We all need spirituality. I am you and you are me. Together we share community. Identity is not confined. You must leave your roots behind. Aha ha ha, aha ha ha, I'm a Really now, really now. Smile and get on down, please. Oh me, oh my, get on a creative high. Pleasure is responsibility. Aha ha ha, aha ha ha. Or why, or how, or when, or when I sigh, I search 
each orgasmic company. I desire cosmic credibility, the focus of consensuality. There is no higher way. This body occupies both space and time. Freedom is not yours or mine. Don't try so hard to change the world you see. Just try and change your inner reality. You will bleed and we will die. What you are suspecting, I must I and I. I am you and you are me. Conquer divisive ideology. Oh ha ha ha, oh ha ha ha, I'm a young. Oh ha ha ha, oh ha ha ha, I'm a young. Mark Laban directed that video. Dougie's work is collected all over Europe and the United States. People like producer Janet Street Porter, designer Zandra Rhodes, um, collectors uh, in Europe, Emmanuel Kahn in Paris, Alan Jones in London, Andrew Logan. I could go on and on. But I just want you to know that we're waiting for Judy Freeman to come in. And as an homage to Picasso, Dougie did this piece. So don't go away. We'll be right back with someone who's going to talk about Picasso. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with author, curator, Judy Freeman. Judy is the former associate curator of 20th century art at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Presently, she's the Joan Whitney Payson curator at the Portland Museum of Art in Maine. She lived in Pablo Picasso's shadow for the last three years while putting together a show called Picasso and the Weeping Women, which has an exhibition schedule at the Los Angeles Museum the County Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and the Art Institute in Chicago. Welcome, Judy. Hi, Joan. <laughs> How does it feel to be living in the shadow of Picasso? Well, now that the exhibition's opened, I feel as if I've been emancipated. <laughs> Do you, wouldn't you like to stay there forever? No, <laughs> definitely not. But it's been a, an exhilarating and fascinating and frustrating period of time because Picasso is a fairly elusive figure. Even though he was so uh, predominantly with us in, in this uh, lifetime of ours. Yes, he's essentially only been dead 22 years. And <coughs> when you consider that, um, 21 years actually, when you consider that, he's actually very immediate as a figure. He's, That's what we he's been with us more recently <coughs> than, say, Ken mm -hmm. John F. Kennedy. So, you know, it's someone that we all sort of have remembered seeing photographs of and seeing images of in, on film, on television, during our lifetime. And were people very willing to talk to you about everything? No. That's and what's so strange. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. I, you know, the <coughs> exhibition that I've done is a very personal and biographical and, um, in a way, psychoanalytic view of Picasso. And because I took that approach and because I think that approach is somewhat different than what people have done when they've worked on Picasso in the past, particularly when they've done exhibitions on Picasso, it raised a whole specter of questions that hadn't been asked for the purpose <coughs> of public consumption before. Oh, I see. And as a result, people get nervous about talking about that. It's, certain it's things, certain things. Well, how did this show or how did a show like this get put together? It, was it your brain child mm -hmm. or brainstorm or brainstorm. whatever? <laughs> well, we had at the County Museum of Art a fascinating painting that had been gifted to the museum in 1955 that is a Picasso weeping woman with handkerchief. And I'll show you an image of that in a moment I, after when we start to talk about the paintings in the show. That painting had been with the museum when the museum wasn't even an independent art museum. Mm. That was a period when the L.A. County Museum was part of the Natural History Museums right. of Los Angeles. So all the more remarkable that this little treasure was sitting there. And we had always installed it in galleries with later work by Picasso, some surrealist work, some early abstract expressionist painting, and never had really given it its own independent due. But I think that's what happens to artists. They're always, ha they're always shown 
with their body of work or a body of 10 years or whatever. You've taken one year, is it, or two years and shown what he and showed what he did then. Well, in effect, I mean, this, the hub of the exhibition is is devoted to the year 1937, mm -hmm. and the weeping women that are the focal point of the show span f the period from January through December of 1937. The work that's been assembled around them begins as early as 1927, actually, and continues through 1942. But you're right; the crux of the show, and the thing that I think people will go away remembering is how strong and how striking the year 1937 was well, for you, Picasso. You took those things and used it as a string yes. to tie that year together, really. So it's phenomenal to see all those things on the wall. Now, how did you track down all these paintings? You started with one painting at the County Museum. Well, in Picasso's case, it's difficult and it's easy in a funny sort of way because Picasso although not the most thorough and meticulous of an as an archivist, um, I was lucky enough that there was a fellow named Christian Zervos who, as Picasso went along making art, Zervos would keep track and have everything photographed and put it together in a catalog. Was he an assistant working for him? No, he actually was a magazine publisher, but he was also a writer. I and see. he, so he just did this. And in 1931, the first couple of volumes on Picasso's work appeared, and ult eventually there were 31 volumes devoted to Picasso's work, plus umpteen editions and supplements. So, in a way, putting this exhibition together initially was very easy. You went to the volume for 1937, you start there, uh -huh. and you start looking. However, these books were published in the 50s, so where those pictures were in the 50s is completely different than where those pictures are now. Do, do, did, did you have to trace them? Oh, incessantly. <laughs> did you? Oh, go on, because I think that's interesting. Yeah. You, you opened your book and you, f you thought you knew where they yeah. were, but they could have changed hands ten times. And, and they had. Oh, they had. And they had, because in many cases with the images of the weeping women, and in particular portraits of women with, to whom Picasso was connected, Picasso basically kept those pictures to himself until he died, or close to oh. his, the period when he oh, died. I see, I see. And then they became disseminated. So okay. that means that you were starting to trace things in the late 1960s, the early 1970s, and after his death in 1973. That gets complicated because that means things pass through the family. It means you then have to go from where the family might have had them to track down whether they sold them publicly or privately. Were there a lot of them? You. Were there a lot of paintings? I mean, couldn't you have just gone to the museums? That where you picked out certain paintings and just gone to a museum where you knew it still was existed? Regrettably not, because <laughs> I wish that were true. There are certainly loans to the, muse from, to the exhibition from various I museums. The Prado Reina Sofia in Madrid, for example, the Musée Picasso in Paris, the Tate Gallery in London, the National Gallery of Victoria in Australia, uh, the Art Institute of Chicago. There are several you know, museum yeah. loans of significant proportion. But think back to where the art world has been since 1973 when works became available mm -hmm. after Picasso's death through inheritances mm -hmm. of children. Not many museums were in the business of buying major works of art by Picasso at that point. I see. Why? Because it's he was too expensive or because he wasn't well known en enough? Oh no, he's certainly well known enough because he was too expensive, too expensive. and because the funds for museum acquisitions are, alas, mm -hmm. not sufficient these days. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult for a museum to buy a Picasso of this period, which is one of the most fascinating and important years in Picasso's career. Consequently, most of the pictures in the exhibition that were not already in the hands of museums by that time, by the early 1970s, are still in private hands. So you couldn't get to them? Of course I got to them, and well, I tracked them through funny, <laughs> you know, funny avenues Did you of go out and see every piece before you put it in the show? Virtually every piece, yeah. And how, how does it happen? How do you get a, a sponsor, or when you say it originates at the Los Angeles County Museum, what does that mean, origination and sponsorship and all of that? Well, there are two separate questions, really. The exhibition was organized by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. That means that the County Museum was responsible for collecting the works of art, having them mm. shipped to the museum helping to coordinate the budget for the exhibition, um, putting together all of the materials in preparation for it, and of course constructing the exhibition and placing it in its galleries. Cons but co the concept came from the County Museum. Well, the concept came from me, and I was at I the see. time 
a curator at the County Museum of Art. It didn't come from the Metropolitan or the Chicago Art Institute. It came from... No, I would hope if the idea came from the Met or the Art Institute that they would have done the exhibition well, that's themselves. What I, <laughs> I, want. I, I think that the yeah. viewers should know that because oh, sometimes absolutely. you don't understand how the uh, machinery works. You know, that's absolutely true and I've heard that often when my FOVE exhibition was at the Met. People thought the Metropolitan had organized it and in fact we had organized <laughs> it here in Los Angeles. So do they put so, money into it as well? the county museum or does it come all by sponsorship? It comes in a variety of ways but of course sure the museum has to you know help pay for the exhibition mm -hmm. but we always look for sponsorship and in the case of this exhibition we were so fortunate because we had the most the kind of sponsorship that everybody hopes to have we had the most enlightened sponsor in the country, if that's possible, and that was Payne Weber, which is a major supporter of the arts. They have, have a museum. They, they have, have a, a do substantial they? art collection of several hundred works of art. And the chairman and, and chief executive officer, Donald Mirren, is one of the oh. most enlightened private collectors and public collectors in the country, right. and he's on the boards of several major museums. So we were lucky because we had a supporter for this exhibition that understood art. So and in addition, we were lucky United Airlines helped out with transportation. Thought, did they send you? Were you part of the transportation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually, United needs to fly to Portland, United. Um. <laughs> but I mean, is that what it is? The uh, airlines then brings the art to Los yes. Angeles, helps bring the art to Los Angeles yes. as well, or takes it to New York or Chicago or wherever? Where they could, they did. Where I they see. had routes, absolutely. Now, you piled, you got this stockpile of paintings together. Mm -hmm. Could you use everything that you found or did you have to be uh, choosy about what you did? Did you have to leave things behind because you couldn't get people to give you things? Well, all of those things are true. I had <laughs> to, I had to, obviously as a curator you edit and you, <coughs> you want beautiful pictures and you want things that are going to help tell a story but also be a rewarding and kind of fulfilling experience for people who look at them. So of <laughs> course you edit, that's the first thing you do. And there were certainly many more images that one could have had but for a variety of reasons one didn't want. I see. But at the same time, yes, certainly we had um, many fun stories of lenders and you know persuading lenders to lend and that's always a struggle. People are really really anxious about lending works of art these days and it's gotten costly you know it's 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 really truly a, a generous favor that they do to share their works of art that they own privately with the general public give us uh, this is maybe crass but just <laughs> give me a range of how much one of those picassos would be just a overall. oh i really couldn't do that um it, but <laughs> I certainly mean in the millions Certainly Picasso is one of those artists who's achieved enormous success <laughs> you financially. Say. No. <laughs> I won't <joke. laughs> you, you could, but you won't. All right, so then you started putting these things together, you edited, you you did you have to leave something behind that you really wanted? Things that I really wanted that I left behind were the results of lenders more is than it, anything, that's sure. What I mean, where is I that just right? I just hadn't sent enough flowers to <laughs> <laughs> the lender or or they just weren't persuaded by my um, my absolute perseverance. I see. What can I, I say? I see. <laughs> so give us a little bit of the history of Picasso's, the way you, you wove it through Koklova, his first wife. Mm -hmm. And you have some... And I have some images. The exhibition essentially looks to situate Picasso's weeping women, this body of work that he made related to the, the big mural Guernica. Um, within the context of both his ideas politically and his ideas personally. When you ask about Olga Koklova, you're asking about a woman who was very much, let me pull out two of these, you have a woman who is very much depicted by Picasso first in a very dramatic kind of neoclassical way. She's mm -hmm. the ideal mother and that's not depicted here for a moment but I'll show you in a second how that's transformed into what is depicted here. First, um, Olga Koklova appears as the ideal, perfect classical woman, idealized mother. You see her often with Picasso and her child, Paolo. But then suddenly after that initial period, which lasts roughly from 1918 to 1925, she becomes first like this here in this painting on the left, where she turns into an almost elongated Gumby-like figure wrapped in the embrace of Picasso, who's also rather monstrous himself. 
And then she moves into the images such as the ones on the right, where you see two large heads. And those large heads really are dominated by little else other than mouths. I know, it's amazing. And the teeth you pointed out, one's spiky and one's uh, like nail heads. That's and right. It sounds like a woman who was just devouring him. Or so he thought. Maybe. <laughs> or so he thought. And I would like to think that there are two sides to that story, but alas, only Picasso is telling his side of it in these pictures. Yeah, I mean, she is certainly not exactly your warm and cuddly wife to come home to. Well, in the case of this image, right. she is a horrific, menacing, um, frightening image. And Picasso was very, very aware of the sounds emanating from her. That's why she's all That's mouth. What it is. And look how very misshapen her head is. Mm -hmm. The way in which the eyes in both of these pictures gravitate to the corners of her <laughs> cheeks as if she's <laughs> kind of like, imploding. I know. It's really wonderful. <laughs> so he didn't want her to look at him with two eyes, it That's looks it. like. That's it. She was essentially, you know, her eyes and her ability to see. And, and Lord knows what it was that why? she was to see. Because there was another woman creeping in here somewhere. Let's see who that was. Well, yes. I mean, it's certainly true that at the time that Picasso <laughs> moves from this image, he's moving from this image into t these two images here. Now, this is a very different kind of, of body of work. These two paintings, the one on the right was made in 1931. The one on the left was made in 1934. Both show us Marie-Thérèse Voltaire. And she was just coming into the picture then? She was a 17-year-old girl when Picasso met her in 1927, the year when those two heads were made that we were just looking at a moment ago. And then uh. Picasso begins to use her as his model over and over again from 1930, 31, 32, incessantly, really. Well, this woman has a beautiful smiling mouth. Mm -hmm. Her eyes are together. <laughs> it looks like she's looking from the profile straight and also straight ahead. That's right. And she's very soft. So he was obviously smitten by someone else. This is true. <laughs> and he very clearly loved painting Marie Therese. Marie Therese Voltaire was a woman who everything about her in Picasso's view was a rounded, curvilinear, sensual, puffy, I call <laughs> her the kind of cloud always. She's kind of soft and cushy. One of the pictures that you have in the exhibit, she's even painted like uh, an angel. Yes. I mean, Isn't that it's great? amazing. She's yeah. wearing a garland of flowers. <laughs> That's right. And this picture on the right, uh, excuse me, on the left, mm. she turns into <clears> this kind of spineless, boneless, floppy woman. And Picasso paints her while she's asleep, which is a favorite pose. There's a picture of Picasso, but he's not really painting her. There's some flowers on the easel. Exactly. He's not painting her as an image. He's painting what he sees her as. as this and is he beautiful. sees her as a plant. He sees her as somebody who is fertile and, <laughs> you know, pr profoundly <laughs> organic. And that's why a plant was a perfectly appropriate stand-in in his view. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that really it's tells really a lot. fascinating. Mm -hmm. Now, when Picasso con develops this relationship with Dora Mar uh, with excuse me Marie Therese Voltaire, Olga Koklova does not know about her. He know she knows that he's got a model who's of considerable interest because we see her blonde hair over and over again, oh. and Olga was very clearly not blonde, and so we have a shift in interest that for Picasso and for Olga creates a problem. Mm -hmm. So when Olga finds out, she challenges Picasso a great deal. And she eventually says that she can no longer live with him when she learns that Marie Therese Voltaire is pregnant. And then what happens? Do we get well, some more paintings? What happens? <laughs> yeah, we get some more paintings, but initially we don't get any paintings because oh. Picasso <coughs> becomes distraught. Here, Olga is making claims over, he thinks, maybe half his work. She mm. wants property. I oh, mean, if they split, if they split happens, up, exactly. Yes. Community property. Well, precisely. And so, it, so Picasso becomes very concerned, very agitated, and he stops making art, as if to say, "I'm worried that half my art that I create may disappear from my control." Mm. Really, it was not a financial issue for him as much as it was a control issue, I think. Mm -hmm. And so he stops painting and he makes poetry for two years, which isn't very good, you said. Well, it's it's very. It's very typical of kind of mediocre surrealist poetry at this time, but it's fascinating in the context of Picasso because he talks about food mm. and the smell of food. He talks about sex, mm. the sounds of sex. He talks about tears 
and the feel mm. and particularly the liquid quality of tears, which is very significant because the exhibition that I'm discussing is, of course, that of the weeping women. Mm -hmm. So tears making their way into his poetry in 35 come back in his pictures of 1937. Let's go on because we don't have too much right. time to talk about uh, the next woman. Let's talk about the next woman. These, well, I'd like to talk for picture. a minute about the weeping woman. Yeah, um, You have one on the set just behind you, and then I have one here, which is the painting that, in fact, started the exhibition. It's the one that's in the county museum. With the handkerchief. With the handkerchief. Now, Picasso begins to make these images in 1937 in the wake of his large painting, Guernica, which was the big mm -hmm. anti-war mural that he made in 37, in which there are no weeping women. But the minute he's starting and in the midst of Guernica, he begins to make weeping women side by side with it over and over again all the way through the month of May, continuing after he finished uh. Guernica till June, through mm. June, through July. Mm. He goes on vacation in August and September and he comes back. So the painting in the book here is June. The painting just behind you is October. And then we have to get to Dora Mar so we can talk about her a little right, bit. Right, absolutely. And will you go to her now? And I will go to her now. <laughs> we just have another. Dora Mar, ah. who is this incredible presence in 1937. She appears in The Weeping Women in the portrait behind you, and she appears here. Oh, this is Dora Mar. This is partly Dora Mar. Oh, I see. And here she is in a kind of more realistic, if you will, portrait here painted in 1942 while she and Picasso are essentially camped in Paris during World War II. She, half Jewish, uh -huh. is able to escape any problems living nearby to Picasso and where Picasso is really protecting her. It's phenomenal. She was an established photographer, well known in her own right, a real forceful personality, actively working on Guernica with Picasso. Oh. But just horrified by the change in events that was occurring around her, around Picasso, politically, economically, socially, in all aspects of their lives, so that she, by 1942, looks like this. She looks fabulous. This is a great painting. Yeah, and I painting. hate to close the program <laughs> on this, but I think that's a good place to stop. You I went do. through all the women, and you told us a little bit. Now we have to go and apply what you've taught us today. Well, come see the exhibition. Great, and we'll go all over the country and see it. Great. Thanks, Judy, for Thank being with you. us. Thank you. And thanks for being with us on the Joan Quinn Profiles, and we'll see you next time.